Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the short, short story, Men Sell Not Such in Any Town by Nalo Hopkinson. Um, and I want to start off by saying that there are some adult implications in this story and that it might not fit fully with the goal of the channel, but I think it's a great examination on um, power, desire, and things that are important to understand, you know, if um, the world is to improve. So let's start off with a passage from this story. Did you hear? Rivner has created a new fruit. How very dull. Her last piece was a fruit too. Rivner's previous fruit, she said, only sang like a rainforest full of parrots. Only enhanced the prescient abilities of those who ate it. This one is the pinnacle. And with that, let's go ahead and move on into our summary. And the whole story, um, you know, it's only three pages or so. So I, I think it's... Um, definitely absorbable. So there's, I'm going to summarize it, but my summary is about a, a fifth of the story as a whole. So in length, um, men sell not such in any town by Nalo Hopkinson is a short story about desire and temptation. The title comes from the poem Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti, but the story has only light thematic and symbolic con connections to the original work. In the story, a mechanical servant shares news about the creation of a new fruit. The servant tempts the diner by describing its taste, texture, scent, and rarity. The diner, a quote, enlightened, unquote, woman named, and I'm going to try my best here, Amaxin Corazon Hunia Principia Delgado III, is initially apathetic towards the fruit, but slowly becomes more and more wrapped with desire as the servant describes it. The servant appears to enjoy teasing and tempting Amaxin both with the fruit and her physicality, and there are hints throughout the story, such as the discussion of benedictions and titles such as Enlightened, that Amaxin is either trying to avoid temptations to become pure or is seeking a level of pleasure beyond what she can currently reach, um, possibly because of some type of societal structure. Uh, the temptation of this new fruit becomes too much to bear, however, and Amaxin caves and requests that the servant order one of the new fruits. Yet it turns out that only 117 of the fruits were made and that they were already sold. The servant seems to have already known this and is scolded and dismissed by Amaxin. The story ends with Amaxin now unable to enjoy her meal and with the servant claiming that she considers herself well paid for the services she just provided. Um, which takes us on into our notes for the story. And there's a lot to talk about with the story, considering its length. The story, again, takes up only three pages in the anthology it comes from, but it suggests societal structures based on pleasure, magic like bioengineering, uh, the manufacturing of desire, the effect of art and poetry, and even examines the relationships between artificial intelligence, servanthood, and the master-servant dynamic. The area that we're going to examine, though, in this video is about how desire can be manufactured. Obviously, advertising can impact what people choose to shop for, and images of celebrity can change what is currently fashionable or appealing. However, most people don't think about how art, literature, and poetry affect what we desire. In the story, the servant is described as a poet by Maxon with both positive and negative connotations. Plato famously argued against poetry, claiming that it could dangerously inspire people to be wrapped up in imitations rather than reality, emotions rather than reason. Quote, and the same may be said of lust and anger and all other affections, of desire and pain and pleasure, which are held to be inseparable from every action. In all of them, poetry feeds and waters the passions instead of drying them up. She lets them rule, although they ought to be controlled if mankind are ever to increase in happiness and virtue." Unquote. And so one of the big questions of the story is, how is the servant able to effectively control and torture her master through poetic description? Why do you think the servant does this? And as always, cite the text and any other sources to support your answer. Again, this is a pretty dense text, so there's a lot of other areas and avenues for discussion with it. Um, but I think that's one that is uh, pretty interesting to uh, examine. With that, thanks for watching. Um, I'll see you in the next video.